Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Last year, we watched cryptocurrencies once again come in as the best performing asset on the planet. Some people understood that. Many people did not. Our guest today is someone who certainly does understand that phenomenon. We are welcoming back to the show the extremely popular Mr. Alessio Rastani of LeadingTrader.com, who taught himself how to trade cryptocurrencies within the typical financial markets. We're thrilled to have him here to get his insight and his perspectives on the future as many people as well as institutional investors are beginning to dip their toes into cryptocurrencies as we all wake up to the unfortunate demise of fiat currencies all across the world. Alicia, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Michelle. Good talking with you. Hope you're well. Yes, you too. It's great to have you here. Um, we are watching something, Alicia, that must be one of the first times on the planet that everyone at the same time completely bottomed out in their currency. Mm -hmm. What is happening that it's all happening in unison? Yeah, um, I guess the, <clears throat> the, the, the fear and panic in the last month, which everyone saw, um, fear and panic both in the real world and also in the financial world. <laughs> I think a very few times I've seen that happening when both the public have been afraid and probably are still afraid because of what's going on. And also in the financial world, we sort of fear being reflected. And this is something actually a lot of people don't understand. Um, there's always, there's been this lie or falsehood, whatever it is, that the markets represent, that stock markets represent the economy. Bitcoin is a reflection of that, obviously. Um, but it's not true. Um, Bitcoin, stock markets have nothing to do with the economy. They're not correlated. Um, and we've seen a pure example of it just now, just recently. So we saw the panic, people panicking, stock market dropped, Bitcoin dropped with the stock market. Um, and then we've seen a rally. You know, despite things not at all improving, economy still looks in pretty bad shape. Massive unemployment in America. Um, there's still no sign of, at, at the very least, things going back to normal. Maybe, maybe, maybe soon. I don't know yet, but we don't know what he knows. Um, and we've seen, uh, you know, record potentially companies going bankrupt soon. Who knows? And also, you know, just uncertainty after uncertainty. And yet the market, we've seen both Bitcoin and the stock market rally higher. So a lot of people have been confused by this, but actually most of us, people like you and me, and people who've been following the market for many years probably have not been confused because we know there's no correlation between the financial market, the stock market, and the economy. This doesn't exist. Um, and in fact, the economy often lags behind the stock market. What's, what has happened, though, and it's been quite interesting, is one of my predictions from about a year ago did come true. And I said that I said if the stock market crashes, Bitcoin will crash as well. And that actually, I have to tell you, I feel a bit relieved because I wasn't sure, to be honest, that the bit, that Bitcoin would fall with the stock market. I, I suspected it would. In fact, I made a video about it saying that I think it would go down with the stock market. But I'm happy that, that's, that that prediction came out true, which has surprised some people because some people thought that Bitcoin would be the safe haven, uh, would go the opposite way to the stock market, but actually it didn't do that. So this is quite important. The reason why this is important is because if you want to know how Bitcoin will do in the short term and maybe in the next few months, and maybe by the end of the year, I would say keep an eye on the stock market as well because there is a correlation between the stock market and Bitcoin at the moment. Who knows, maybe in a few years, maybe in about by the, maybe by the end of the year, the correlation will stop, maybe there'll be a decoupling. But for the moment, there is this correlation between the two, a positive correlation. So um, I'm feeling bullish about the stock market. Actually, I've been bullish on the stock market for many weeks now. People may be surprised to hear that. Um, I had been calling for the stock market to go higher uh, for, for several weeks, even back in March, when, 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 when the stock market was crashing, I was bullish on the market even back then. Now, in case you're wondering, how does that relate to Bitcoin? Well, as I was saying, because I've been bullish on the stock market, I'm also bullish on Bitcoin as well. Because I think both of them are going up in tandem. If you actually put a chart of the S&P 500 with Bitcoin together, superimpose them one another, one another you'll see they peaked and troughed by the same point, by the same time. The line goes almost in tandem. 
So, actually, I forget what your question was, but going back to what you were saying, um, so I feel pretty bullish about Bitcoin and about cryptocurrencies for this year. I think that as long as the financial markets hold strong, as long as we see this rally continuing, don't get me wrong here, markets don't go up in a straight line. Bitcoin won't go up in a straight line either. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, there'll be volatility, there'll be some glitches, some ups and downs, but I do think we bottomed back in March. So I disagree with some people who think that they're expecting another crash back to the end, back to the lows of March. I may be wrong on that, <laughs> we'll see. But I actually think that we did bottom in March. I, 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 actually, I, actually, I actually called the bottom for the markets several weeks ago. Same goes with Bitcoin. So I remain bullish on Bitcoin and the stock markets going forward which is good news for cryptocurrencies in general going forward from here on. And I think that perhaps the next major pullback in Bitcoin, probably there will be a pullback at some point in the next few weeks, maybe the next few months, I think there will be a retracement to this rally. That retracement for me is a buying opportunity. Perfect. Yeah, I just, um, it's remarkable how everything goes in unison. Um, it goes up, it goes down, and it's doing it across the world, which mm -hmm. is such a phenomenon. Um, it's a testament of the times, but everybody's interlinked in this, and that leads me into this global shutdown. Mm -hmm. um, Alessio, it has to be one of the most impactful you know, economic actions, at least in the past century. What do you see as the ramifications of this situation on overall investments and also upon the social world? You know, getting a little bit out of economics, what do you see from your part of the world? Um, well, firstly, let me say that whatever happens as far as the economy is concerned, and it's a good question you ask. As far as what happens to the economy, what happens to the fundamentals of the economy and the world, that will be a separate question from what happens to the actual financial markets and Bitcoin. Because as I mentioned before, price, the, the way price acts is going to be different from the way the economy will act. Um, I do think that, I mean, it's a good question. At the moment, it seems there are more pessimists than there are optimists. And I know this because I pay attention to what people are typing in the comment section. And there will be, there'll be comments in this video as well. So <laughs> I'll, I'll look forward to reading them. But a lot of the comments I'm reading, especially on my own videos and other people's videos, is very negative about, about the economy and the stock market and the Bitcoin as well, I think. Um, but really a lot of pessimistic, negative views about the economy. And it's not surprising. I mean, I don't blame people for being pessimistic and being bearish about the way the economy is going because so many people, about 20 million people are being made unemployed in America. Things are looking really shaky. Even if we go back to normality, we don't even know what normality will be. I mean, it's true. I mean, they're saying in the UK that perhaps the shutdown will continue. I've heard from certain sources the shutdown may continue into June and July, which is pretty bad news, I think. Um, and even if it doesn't go all the way to June, July, can we really go back to the way things were? Probably not. Um, so I, I, I guess the question is, how quickly can people go back to work? That's the number one question. I honestly don't know. I can't pretend I know that answer. How, qu how quickly will people go back to work? How quickly will, and even if they do, those companies that have been, those companies that have been, um, you know, several companies in America and here in the UK haven't been able to make any money for the last month or so. It's possible those companies may file for bankruptcy. Some of them were very weak. And some of them, even if they don't file for bankruptcy, will be in debt. So they'll, they're, I've actually got a book here I've been reading, Michelle. I'm going to point this out to you guys. I bought this 10 years ago. It's called The Holy Grail of Macroeconomics by Richard Koo and Lessons from Japan's Great Recession. Um, I just mentioned this because... Hey, Alicio, please hold that up for a full screen yeah, for sure. everyone so they can see. Yeah, it's called The Holy Grail of Macroeconomics by Richard Koo, as you can see there. So uh, it's an interesting book. And it's, it's, it says over here, The Lessons Learned from Japan's Great Recession. And what Richard Koo, the person, the author here says, it's quite an interesting book here. Um, he says that after Japan's recession, companies spent a lot of time paying debt, paying off their debts and not actually buying. So as opposed to as opposed to companies um, borrowing more to get the economy going, so as opposed to people and companies in Japan borrowing more money to get the, you know, spending, getting better spending and borrowing more. Instead, what happened was they're paying off their debts, 
which is why it took such a long time for Japan to get out of their recession. They were in the recession for a very long time, over a decade. And it's quite interesting, actually. It, it, there's a chapter here also about the 1929, the 1929 depression, the Wall Street crash, which has also been in the news recently because the crash that we had in March has been the fastest crash in history. It, it, the crash actually exceeded the speed and intensity of the 1929 crash, which is interesting. So it's one for the books, one for the records. So I would say there's a lot we don't know. We don't actually know. Nobody really knows exactly how the economy and the stock market and Bitcoin will move forward here because this crash has been unlike anything in history. So anything we're going to say here just depends on certain things we've learned from the past, but the future doesn't have to follow, doesn't have to necessarily follow the historical patterns. Um, at the moment, it seems that people are split here. The majority view seems to be, the majority view is, we're going to continue dropping more. This is what makes me bullish because I'm a contrarian. Maybe you're a contrarian too, by the way, Michelle, but I think most people are. But I did a poll recently and the majority view, not just in my poll, but across the board, even hedge funds, the majority of people seem to believe that this rally we've had, this bounce, is just a bear market bounce. It's, not, it's a phony rally, so that people believe. And they believe, the majority believes we're going to have another crash below the lows of March. This is what makes me bullish, because if the majority believe that, then I'm, I'm going to take the opposite point of view. Because the reason, there is, it's, not, it's not just because I'm just, I'm just going against the majority. It, it also means that it also means that there are so many people on the sidelines right now, including hedge funds. There are so many people on the sidelines of this. They're not getting into the market. That, that means this. That means there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines that might get into the market once people believe in this rally. So that could push the market even higher. So if there's not enough money in this rally in Bitcoin and also in the stock market, because so many people, so many, so many people are scared right now, once this rally keep, keeps going higher, and I think we will probably go higher in the next few weeks, probably sentiment will change, sentiment will change, people will start pouring in again, and that money, that, that liquidity will push these markets higher again. So that's why I think that in the, in the short term and the long term, well, put it this way, I think in the long term, short term is a bit difficult to predict, but as far as the long term is concerned, by the end of the year, I, I remain bullish on Bitcoin, because I remain bullish on the stock market as well. So interesting. I want to turn briefly to mm -hmm. um, trading cryptos, yeah. which is what you do. And um, you're extraordinary the way you call things, too, also. You've, I've watched it's also track extraordinary. Track Sorry over the past you, year. It's been, you're, you are a contrarian. Everything someone would say, you know, I'd read, you know, the experts, they'd all be, you know, unison across the board. You'd say the opposite and the opposite would happen. <laughs> so it was, it was very interesting. That's funny because some people, there are some right. people who obviously don't like my videos and I get that. That's okay. I get the occasional troll saying, they say, okay, well, whatever Alessio says, just do the opposite. And that's probably true. <laughs> exactly. that, that actually has been correct sometimes. So I'm going to, I'm going to let them pass on that one. But I, I would say that most of my calls this year has been correct, which is fortunate. I have made some terrible calls in the past. Uh, probably 2019 was, was my worst year. Um, but I'd say this year has been pretty kind. The, mar the market's been kind to us yeah, or to me. You've, you've been doing well. And I, I want to talk to you briefly in um, trading cryptocurrencies. Um, stable coins are now distributing dividends. And in a world without any yield, for government mm. bonds. This is amazing. In your opinion, is this the reason that um, there is some more appeal for cryptocurrencies right now? Or do you think that many people are still not yet aware how far cryptos have come in terms of what has always been considered the territory of belonging only to traditional investment activities? Talk to us about dividends in cryptos? Yeah, I mean, you ask a very good question, which is that I don't think enough people have got into, <clears throat> I don't think enough people are still a believer in cryptocurrencies. And that probably has changed over time. I think in 2017, when Bitcoin was in the massive bubble, a lot of people got into Bitcoin because of that publicity that it got. Probably at the worst time, by the way. I think the majority of people got into it at the worst time, probably December, November of 2017. 
right before the crash. I would say a lot of people also got into Bitcoin last year during the massive rally that we had as well. Uh, I think it was in the summer of 2019. Uh, I would say, look, this, these things are cyclical or cyclical, however you want to say it. Uh, but I think that once, <clears throat> once we come out of this bear market or this crash that's occur occurred, once we see an uptrend developing in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and we will, we will do that. I think I am optimistic for cryptos going forward. I think once the uptrend resumes, and once we see those parabolic rallies again, people will start in becoming interested again, not just in Bitcoin and altcoin. I think at the moment, people are sitting on the sidelines because of so much. Because let's face it, at the moment, the number one news story is not probably Bitcoin or cryptos or even financial markets. It's mostly, you know, the whole virus stuff. So I think once people, I think once things get better back to normal, let's hope it does. People, once people stop thinking about <laughs> the virus, we go back to normality. I think people will start to feel confident again. And that's when we can get people probably see more money coming in back into cryptos. But I will say this, though, the time there's an, there's an interesting phrase. Uh, I, I think uh, who said this Rothschild, Mayor, Mayor Rothschild. He's talked he talked about blood being on the streets. Um, and I think and Rockefeller then said the time the way to make money is to buy when there's blood in the streets. So what, what they were talking about is that the time to buy into the market, whether it's Bitcoin or stock markets, is when everyone, when everyone is afraid. So I think that the big bargains and the big deals, it's the, if, you want to, if you want to find those big bargains, those discounts in the financial market and in Bitcoin, that is precisely when you want to become interested, when there's a fear in the market, the panic, like it was a few weeks ago. So... You know, that, to, to me, that, that, that major crash was a major opportunity. I still think that we will have opportunities like that in the future as well. I don't think this, I don't, I don't think the volatility has ended. There will be some more volatility, some more ups and downs in the near future. Uh, but I think that anyone who thinks like a contrarian should be thinking that, okay, if we do get another drop in the financial markets and in Bitcoin, rather than thinking that's something to be terrified of, Instead, we should be thinking, well, that may, be a, that may be a buying opportunity as well. Don't get me wrong here. People should be taking care of the risks. Like, I'm not saying, I'm not saying just jump head first and trying to call the bottom. I'm not trying to say that. But I am saying as long as you're controlling the risk, as long as you're not over leveraging or as long as you're, as long as you're being responsible about how much you're putting into these markets and not, not betting, the, you know, betting your, the entire farm, right. you know, you might do well. Right. Alicia, let's switch gears just for a moment. I want to talk about what's happening with oil. Mm -hmm. This, of course, is very troubling all across the world. Um, there's so much of an oversupply mm -hmm. right now. It's terribly difficult to simply shut off the valves. There is um, a global overflow right now, and the buildup is going to take years to flow out. When we talk about an economic shutdown, the fact that this is completely destroying the oil industry in the short term is really alarming. But, of course, it's happening to most businesses and industries across the planet. But right now, I just want to focus in upon the oil industry because these are many times families. This is, mm -hmm. these are, this is generational wealth mm -hmm. that people have you know, their great grandfathers started and um, they've always known it. it's a way of life. Mm. And so outside of the economic impact, I want to focus in a little bit upon the emotional impact of what this is having as far as going into the depressions, especially within the oil sector. Let's explore mm. this just a little bit with everybody, Alicia. Yeah, you ask a good question. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories right now. I mean, I was speaking to a I was speaking to one of my relatives in America, and he was saying that, <laughs> that he was saying that the reason why oil went so dramatically low is because the Saudis want to destroy the uh, oil business in America. That might be true. I don't know. I, it's possible that maybe there is some kind of um, cartel behind the scenes. Well, we know that we know there is a cartel, OPEC. But but it's what I'm saying is that there is possibility that maybe there is, um, there's more to it than what we see. Maybe it is some kind of a conspiracy to tr destroy the oil business, the competition, the major competition. I wouldn't say it's a major competition to Saudis. Saudis have got, got a lot more to worry about. Saudis got Iran to worry about. 
you know, a major competition around them. But yeah, maybe, maybe they do want to also get rid of the competition in America as well. Um, however, I would say I'm still, as far as oil is concerned, I'm taking the opposite perspective. Usually when there's such strong fear and pessimism in oil and the, oils, the oil industry, that's about the time you see a reversal or at least a reversal in trend and a bottoming formation. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not yet seeing a bottom in oil. I would wait for oil to get above 20 bucks before I become bullish on it. At the moment, I'm not terribly bullish until I see a break of resistance. So if you look at the chart of oil right now, you'll see oil just took out a major support, the floor, if you want to call it that, a $20 level. So last time I checked, I think oil was trading around about 15 or maybe 17, something like that. So oil has to go back above 20 bucks and stay above it at least for a few days, maybe at least a week or two for me to become bullish on it. If you can do that, if we see the price of oil reversing in the next couple of months or next few weeks, go back above $20 and stay above it for at least a week or two, um, that would give me more, much more confidence that we might have seen the bottom in oil and start an uptrend. Now, again, people, people might scoff at that. They might disagree with that. They think, well, why would oil go up when there is, as you were saying, things are not looking good in the economy. It seems like a low in demand. To be honest, nobody really knows. Uh, these are very, these are, oil is a commodity that is also very cyclical or cyclical when it goes in cycles. And these commodities, it's hard to predict. Uh, but one thing we do know is whenever they drop to extreme lows, that is about the time they usually see reversals. We've seen these cycles before, happened in 2016, happened in 2015, I think it was as well. When, usually when everybody becomes extremely pessimistic and bearish on a specific market like oil, that is about the time you should be, you should be looking the other way. You should be looking for some kind of a reversal pattern, a reversal cy a, a cycle. That's what I'm looking at right now. There is some hope here as well. I mentioned this in a recent video. While oil has been dropping, one thing hasn't dropped, which is interesting. Oil stocks have kept actually relatively strong. For example, if you look at the stocks of BP, British Petroleum, Shell, Exxon, they did not go below their March lows. They stayed above their March lows. They've been holding relatively stronger than oil. Was that something so, you would expect or is that, was that a shock? Well, here's the thing. Uh, it's a good question. Common sense or fundamentals would say, well, if oil is dropping so significantly lower, these companies would go out of business, so therefore you would see their stocks massively dropping, but it hasn't done that. So in terms of a comparison relative, relative strength, while oil has been crashing, oil stocks have not seen that massive crash below the March, the March lows. They've actually, hold, if you look at the chart of XLE, which is the ETF for oil stocks, they actually have been holding strong. Same, same, same with the chart of XOP. If you look at XOP, the ETF for oil exploration companies, they've actually been holding relatively strong as well. When I say strong, I mean they're above their March lows and they've been going sideways and above their 21 moving average. So look, that, that might change in the next few weeks. We, we don't know. It's possible that, that that situation may change in the next few weeks. But at the moment, as long as oil stocks remain above the March lows, that tells me something. It tells, it tells me that that things are not as bad as everyone thinks it is. Mm. These, these oil stocks, they're, hold, they're, being, they're holding strong probably for a reason. Somebody's buying them. Somebody's still holding them together. So, um, and so we'll see what happens here. I am actually interested in picking up oil stocks. I think they're really low. I mean, here's the one good thing about oil stocks that people may not realize. People may ask, well, why would you want to buy oil stocks? Because they pay huge dividends. I mean, you were talking about dividends just a few minutes ago, uh, Michelle. The dividend yield for some of these oil stocks and XLE is 12%. XLE uh, is the ETF for oil stocks. They pay 12% dividend, which is really high. I mean, quite, quite nice. I mean, if you think about it, I don't know a single bank that pays you 12% per annum. So that's why they're attractive. Now, some people may say, I've had this before. Some people say, well, maybe they won't pay those dividends given what's happening in the economy. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not going to speculate on that. But that's what I'm saying is that oil stocks so far have been outperforming oil price. And I think that is, that is a bullish sign for both oil and for the oil industry.
That's very interesting that the stocks have not been that affected, and you're seeing that as a very good sign for oil itself to make a rebound, and for that reason, you're bullish. Alicia, what are your top picks right now? Uh, in okay. terms of cryptos? Mean? In terms of everything. We want to know. Well, let's start with cryptos, because I know a lot of your viewers probably are watching this video because of the crypto market. My top picks, I would say I'm really interested in what's happening with a couple of cryptos. One of them is Ethereum. The other one is Monero. Ethereum has actually been outperforming Bitcoin. Um, now, I know that some people watching this video won't like me talking about altcoins. There are some people who just Bitcoin maximalists, I think what they're called. They despise anything to do with altcoins. That's okay. That's fine. But I think it's worth, I actually think it's a good idea to diversify and have a finger in every pie anyway. So I think Ethereum has been outperforming Bitcoin, holding a lot stronger than Bitcoin, which is a good thing for Bitcoin, by the way, because in the past, historically speaking and statistically speaking, usually when Ethereum is outperforming Bitcoin, that, is, that bodes well for both markets, for both cryptocurrencies. So that's another reason I've been bullish on Bitcoin, because I've seen Ethereum being relatively stronger for explain the moment. Explain the that theory for us. I can't explain it. Uh, well, um, I, in terms of the fundamentals of it, I really can't. Um, but but the sure results, people, what, what, so uh, when you see, yeah. go through that one more time for everybody. Yeah, okay, so statistically speaking, historically, usually when Ethereum is outperforming Bitcoin, um, that is about the time when Bitcoin comes out of the, comes out of the sort of the, uh, the, the bear market and goes back into bull market. So in other words, what I'm saying is if you look back in previous crashes, like the crash we had, okay, so after the crash in 2018, December 2018, if you look at 2019, early 2019, Ethereum was leading, Bitcoin was lagging behind Ethereum. So if you look at the chart of ETH BTC, you'll see ETH BTC Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, it was going higher before Bitcoin started to come out. So this is a good sign for Bitcoin. When Ethereum is leading, when Ethereum is gathering strength relative to Bitcoin, previous crashes have shown that that's a positive sign for Bitcoin. Usually that leads to a continued bullishness on bull market for Bitcoin as well. So that's, that's one thing. That's an interesting indicator. I've never heard yeah, that it before. Yeah, it is. Can, so it, it, yeah. Mark that for everybody. Also, I'm looking at Litecoin. Litecoin has always, sometimes, sometimes Litecoin has also been a good leading indicator. That was the case in February of 20, uh, February 2019, as it was a very good leading indicator. I don't know if that's going to happen this year around. Maybe. Uh, the other one I'm watching is Monero. Monero has been holding really strong. For example, Monero just recently went above its 200 daily moving average. Um, same goes with some other, some other cryptos too. Uh, some other cryptos also been going above the 200 moving average, like uh, Chainlink is one of them. Uh, but Monero, I'm watching, the reason I quite like Monero is because it's already completed five waves. So when I say five waves, I'm talking about Elliott wave theory. According to Elliott wave theory, trends are composed of five waves. So when you look at the chart of XMR versus the dollar, so Monero, uh, you will see that you, you can actually make out five waves within the movement. You can probably say the same thing about Bitcoin too, but you can see it much more clearly in Monero. So Monero is one, one that I'm watching. I quite like the fundamentals of Monero too, because I, had a, I was interviewing uh, Dominic Frisbee, the author of the book, Future of Money, Bitcoin, the Future of Money. And Dominic actually said that one reason he likes the Monero is because of the privacy features, uh, which apparently some of the cryptos don't have. So this is probably one reason why we're seeing the strength in Monero, strength also in Ethereum. So when I'm looking at the charts of Ethereum and Monero and Bitcoin, I'm, look, I'm seeing already five waves in these markets, which is, the, which is essentially what it's telling me is that we're potentially starting wave one of the big major uptrend. Why wave one? Because wave one in Elliott Wave Theory is composed of five waves. So what does this mean? It means if we're starting the uptrend, this means that potentially in the next couple of months, I would say probably my prediction would be by June, we're going to have another major retracement, pullback. It's going to be a major pullback. No, not, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that Bitcoin or cryptos are going to go back all the way to the lows of March. I don't think it's, I don't think it's probable. It might do that, sure. But I don't think it's likely. I think it's much more likely we'll see another major retracement, a pullback down. Maybe a 50% retracement, maybe a 38.2 retracement, like a Fibonacci retracement. 
and then we're going to see the uptrend continue. So what I would be looking out for in these cryptos right now, I wouldn't be getting into these cryptos. Well, that's up to everyone. It's up to everyone to decide. What I'm trying to say is I wouldn't want to take on too much risk right now. I, want to, I don't want to get into Bitcoin and these cryptos at the moment. Why? Because I think that the risk of another retracement back down, another maybe a pullback, the risk of a pullback is too strong. I would wait for Bitcoin maybe to hit some key resistance levels, like the 200 moving average, and then wait for a retracement, a pullback of some sort, maybe a 20%, 30%, you know, a pullback of uh, retracement of, a, of its rally, and then look to get long on that retracement. If some, that's my, that, would be my, that would be my plan if, if I'm looking to establish more of a long-term position. Now, I want to stay with Bitcoin right now because we have sure. something coming up um, in May. I think it's the 11th and 12th of May. That's a very big event. And I'd like you to explain to everybody what the happening is. Um, uh, maybe for people that aren't familiar with Bitcoin, what this means and what your prediction is. Um, will this affect Bitcoin? Will, will, because right now, everybody thought it was going to be fantastic. But seeing now as the, what the environment is, that we're in, it might not even make a blip. Put it this way, uh, I think the happening has been talked about for so, such a long time that um, I would be surprised if it had much of an impact. I mean, probably people might think I'm crazy, but I would be very surprised if it had a, such a massive impact on the price that everyone thinks it is, uh, purely because I think there's such an expectation of it already you might argue that's already been priced in, it's already been absorbed into the price. Don't get me wrong here. I think there will be, there'll be some volatility. There will be some intraday volatility when the happening occurs. Uh, maybe we'll see some pullbacks possibly on the day. Um, maybe, maybe, I don't know if the pullback, I don't know which direction it's gonna go though. That's the big question because nobody can predict that. Is it gonna be a volatility upward? But put it this way, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact in the long term. Um, I just think it's going to be, it's going to be a, some kind of volatility on the day. But otherwise, the trend, I don't think it's going to affect the trend that much. The trend is up, in my opinion. The trend in Bitcoin and these cryptos are up at, at the moment. So I would much rather focus on that. Put it this way, if the happening causes the Bitcoin price to drop, which I don't think, I, I don't know if it's going to do that, but if it does, if, it's sudden, if it has an impact for it to drop down, let's say, to a support level, I would use that as a buying opportunity personally. On the other hand, if the halving causes a spike in the price, let's say it's a spike in, into 8,000 or 9,000, sorry, if it spikes into 8,000, 9,000 territory, I would use it as an opportunity to short Bitcoin. So I would just take the contrarian perspective on that. So what I would say is, my perspective is I wouldn't take any position on the halving right now. It's impossible to predict which direction it's going to go at the moment. Um, I think the trend is up. So therefore, what I would do is if it were to spike down, if it were to drop down, let's say, to support level, like let's say if it were to spike down to 5,800, let's say, or the 6,000 levels, I would use it as a buying opportunity with a stop loss, obviously. Um, but if it were to spike up into resistance, let's say spiked up, there's a gap, by the way, on the chart in the CME chart. If people look at the CME chart of Bitcoin, they can actually see there's a gap, massive gap before it crashed. Well, as it crashed, actually, I should say. It might actually spike up and fill that gap. The gap, I think, goes all the way to the 9,000 level, if I'm not mistaken. I might be mistaken. I don't know. 9,000, 9,300 level, I think the gap is about that level. So it might go and fill that gap. So, and again, I would say this, if it spikes up and fills the gap, I would use that as a shorting opportunity. Um, depending on how, on how you want to play that, you might want to wait for a kind of a reversal pattern before you want to short it. But you want to have a stop loss, obviously, in place as well. So that's what I would say. That's how, it, that's how I would play that. But I would be surprised. I'll be honest with you. I'm interested to see what happens, but I would be surprised if it had a major devastating or positive long-term impact. I don't think it will. Right, because it's been so publicized. It's so anticipated. Yeah. It's priced in already. And I think, look, uh, I mean, 
one thing I've learned in one thing I've learned is this: is that often when when everyone is expecting the same sort of outcome, usually the opposite happens. And usually, when an event is so widely known and expected, there are traders already positioning themselves for this having. They've been doing it maybe even recently, maybe even for the last few weeks and months. So whatever whatever people think is going to happen on this having, just remember there are people. Big, the big money traders have already been planning for this having, so they've probably been positioning themselves already. already been, so a lot, a lot of this has been absorbed in the price. But look, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe nothing will happen. Maybe something will happen. But it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> it's Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it will, maybe yeah. it won't. <laughs> We're along for the ride. Sure. Now, Alicia, I want to get a price prediction from you. What do you see Bitcoin doing this year and in this new decade? Of the 2020s, what do you foresee? Uh, 2020. Uh, that's a very good, quick, very good question. I, I would say this: as long as Bitcoin remains above 5,800, which is a key support level, I remain bullish. So, as long as Bitcoin can protect that level, not fall below it, I would say I'm a bull on Bitcoin. So, I think that Bitcoin probably will be targeting by the end of the year. I think we could see above 10,000 on Bitcoin. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised even if it eventually went, don't get me wrong, I don't think it's going to be a straight move. I don't think it's going to be like a nice steady ride. It's not going to be like that at all. But I do think we're going to see some kind of a retracement, some kind of sideways action. But all I would say is this, um, I would just say because the majority view right now is so bearish on the financial market, the stock market, and also Bitcoin, I'm happy to take the contrarian perspective. Um, and I would say that my, my prediction for the end of the year by 2020 is very likely will be above 10,000, pro probably by October or December. If I was to make a guess as to where, I would say between the 10,000 or 12,000 level. I wish I, I wish I could be more bullish than that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can be. The reason is that I think there's still a lot of bit of uncertainties in regards Put it this way, um, the correlation with Bitcoin and the stock market is going to be important. Because the correlation exists, positive correlation between Bitcoin and the stock markets, if I think that the stock market is going to go and make all-time new highs by the end of the year, that makes me bullish about Bitcoin as well. So therefore, I think that, uh, yeah, I think I could comfortably say that will be above, I think we'll, be, we'll go back into uh, an uptrend or a bull market in Bitcoin very likely by the end of this year. And I think that we will be in the 10,000 to 12,000 range by the end of the year as well. Some people may see that, some people who are watching this video might think I'm being a bit too conservative, maybe a bit too bearish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they might say, come on, man, we're 15K, 20K by the end of the year. I, I'm not that confident. Let's just keep it one step at a time. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in Bayesian probability. Look, once we get above 10K, then we can discuss 15 and K, 15K, 20K. So I wouldn't count my chickens just yet. Let's wait for Bitcoin to get above 10K, which I think we will do. Once we're above 10K, then we'll probably have another pullback, and then we can move up to 12K. Once we get above 15K, then, then we can sit down and talk about 20K. But I don't think we're going to be, I don't think we're going to be in 20k this year. No, um, 15k possibly, but I think I'm more comfortable with a 10k to 12k prediction. That's still very good. That's a very yeah. stable investment. Yeah, but let me just say one more time: as long as Bitcoin remains above 5,800, mm. if it falls below 5,800, you can ignore what I just said. So, because below that level, very likely we'll be going back down to, to the lows of March. So. Just, just I'm, I'm mentioning that because um, it's, you know, making predictions and making calls is not a one and done deal thing. Mm -hmm. you've, got to, you've got to look at your key levels. So the way I'm looking at it right now is keeping it simple. As long as we're above support, I'm a bull. If it falls below support, I'll change my mind and I'll have to become a bear. But I'm remaining a bull for the moment. Okay, great. And the 58 yeah. um, level is where once it drops below that, it's an indication that confidence is going away fast and you probably should get out at the moment, right? Okay. I, 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 would, I would have my stop loss about there, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So. What, 
is your favorite investment at the moment before we go? What's a safe My favorite what investment? You, real estate? Um, what, where, where are you? In? Yeah, real estate what? is interesting. I'm waiting for real estate to get cheaper first before I buy, especially in London. I don't think we've got, I don't think prices have dropped yet to the, to the point where I want to buy them. At the moment, my favorite investments probably are, yeah, I would say US stocks and emerging market stocks probably as well because they're just cheap. Well, they were cheap a few weeks ago. Um, I would wait for another drop in those markets, which might happen probably by, I would say in the next three to six months, we might have another drop in these markets. Not a, not, I'm, not, I'm not speaking, when I say drop, uh, I have to be careful. I don't think we're going to go back to the lows of March. Uh, I don't think we're going to go back to a panic lows. Although if it did happen, wonderful, because that would give another opportunity. But I don't, what I think is going to happen is we're going to have another pullback, a major pullback retracement in the next three months or next five months anyway. And that might just give another opportunity to get long or bullish on U.S. stocks, emerging market stocks. So I'm looking at ETFs, obviously. European stocks should be looked at as well. Uh, European stocks are cheap, undervalued at the moment here. Um, so, so I've been buying U.S. stocks. I've been buying U.K. stocks. Those are my favorite investments. Um, U.K. stocks are attractive purely because of the dividends they pay, much higher dividends than you get from U.S. markets. So, you know, just I would, and, and I know maybe some of your viewers probably hate stocks in general. I, I get this from my viewers on my channel. Some of, some of them don't like the idea of investing in the stock market, but I think it's a mistake to avoid stock markets because uh, you, you need to be diversified. You, you need to have a nice diversification among these markets, whether it's Bitcoin, stock markets. So, yeah. Uh, I would say those are my favorites right now. Yeah, your philosophy being don't listen to the story. Yes. Look at what's happening. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, just, I would say do the opposite of the majority, especially at extremes. So when I say do the opposite of the majority, I need to be, I need to be careful about that. You don't, want to be the, you don't want to be the opposite of the majority or the herd every time. Sometimes the majority is right, usually in, usually in a trend. Usually, usually an uptrend or the start of an uptrend, usually the majority is right. Uh, the way you want to be careful is at extremes. So let me give an example. In January, February of 2020, this year, I issued a warning against stock markets. I put a chart of, um, I call it like my bubble, my bubble chart. The chart showed that um, record amounts of people had been buying call options in the US stock market. Record, in fact, the highest since the dot com bubble. And that to me was alarm bells. This happened, by the way, in January, February, just before the crash. And when I saw that, I put that out there in my videos and I said, look, right now is a terrible time to be in the stock market because, because it's a bubble, massive bubble. And pretty much soon after that, the market crashed. We saw a major crash. Then everybody changed. So what I'm saying is ex there was extreme greed, extreme fear of missing out uh, back in January. The exact opposite happened when the market dropped, when the market crashed. So in March, by the end of March, you had extreme fear. Everybody was afraid. Nobody liked stocks. If you said, if, honestly, if you read some of, the, some of the comments that people wrote to me back at the end of March, <laughs> really, well, I, got, I got loads of rude comments against me <laughs> saying, Alessio's lost his mind, doesn't know what he's talking about. Because um, I, I was saying, look, get ready for a bounce. Get, get ready for a rally in the market. But of course, people were saying I was crazy. They're saying, look, we're going to go into depression. We're going to go into massive. We might, we might go into depression, yes. But again, as I was saying before, there is a disconnect between the economy and the stock market. So what I'm saying is um, always be one step ahead of the majority. If the majority are extremely, uh, and I do want to use this word, extremely bearish, you want to go against them. Similarly, if they're extremely optimistic and greedy, you want to go against them. Uh, so look for extremes in sentiment. When you, when you see these extremes, you want to be... Um, you want to be taking the opposite. And in case people are wondering, well, how do you know what's an extreme? Uh, I, would, I would say look at the charts, obviously, because look at, the, look at how far away they are from certain key levels. Um, I would say look at uh, surveys. There are surveys done every week or every month, I think, about how people feel about the stock market. And usually these surveys tell you 
how bearish people are, how optimistic they are, how uh, pessimistic they are. And when you see the extremes in sentiment, you want to be the you want to do the opposite. So, right, sentiment, sentiment. One of the most important things people leave out. Yes, you know, it, it's how people feel. You know what I mean as to That's what right. they're going to do. Aliso, you are so fascinating every oh, time because you. you have you're such a detailed trader. And many times people are like, he says he doesn't know except if it does this and this and this and this and except if he does. And that's because he watches it, you know, mm. second by second by second by second and then brings it all to your audience. You're fascinating. You. So no, I think one of, the things, um, one of the things you learn is that I think, I think for anybody who's watching this video who's traded the markets for at least a few years knows that the market has a habit of making you humble and uh, because the market eventually at some point humiliates everybody. And as I've been humiliated many times. So you have to be careful. You have to believe in probabilities and possibilities. I've said this in my videos as well. You've got to believe not just in probabilities, but possibilities. So what does that mean? It means that even though I remain, let's say, bullish on a market, let's say Bitcoin and stock markets, at the back of my mind, I realize I could be wrong. Um, whereas, if, whereas if you listen to some of the experts on television, Especially the more I have a rule now. I have a, I learned a rule, which is that the more the more confident somebody sounds on television, especially on mainstream media, the more likely they're wrong. <laughs> so what I mean is, when somebody's saying, "I absolutely one hundred percent, ninety nine percent believe that this market is going to go up," I'm thinking, "Whoa, this person is way too confident," and I'm usually and I'm usually going to bet bet against that person because. Nobody's ever that confident. I don't, no, no one who's been in the markets for several years is ever that confident because they know that they can't be that confident. So, yeah, try and do the opposite of the majority. And I would say be very careful about not getting too overconfident about anything uh, because that is usually very risky. That's, I just love it because you're, you're always on your toes. Please tell everyone about your website and your YouTube channel and how everyone can follow your work. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, people can find me obviously on our website, Leading Trader, leadingtrader.com, I should say. Um, they can also, yeah, I can join us for, for free uh, on Leading Trader. We send out um, like free videos about two to three times a week. Um, they can also join my YouTube channel, um, YouTube, just youtube.com forward slash Alessio Rastani. Um, yeah, and subscribe. Uh, so, thank you again. Listen, Michelle, thank you very much for having me on your show, and it's been a great pleasure talking with you. Yes, it's always wonderful to have you here. Mr. Alicio Rastani of LeadingTrader.com. For cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. Mm -hmm.